All right. Well, welcome to um, Into the Trinity, season three, uh, where we're going to be looking at the synopsis of a purer theology, which is I'm going to I'm going to call it that from now on. SPT, synopsis of a purer theology. Yeah, and we've got a couple editions uh, available for folks as well. We've got the Brill uh, standby expensive edition and then a new paperback edition as well, which we'll be using uh, from Davenant, the, just with just the English text, um, you got to get the Brill edition for the Latin as well. Yeah, yeah. So this is great. Uh, the synopsis of a pure theology. It's two volumes. It's uh, it's nicely printed. It's hardcover. It lays open pretty well, so if, um, it's not too tightly bound. Um, and it's you know it's it's affordable, which is a real game changer. The the synopsis of a pure theology, or what's sometimes nicknamed the Leiden synopsis. Um, uh, has been a reference point, has been very influential in Protestant theology, especially Reformed theology. Um, and it's just been sort of inaccessible. It hasn't been in English until that Brill edition uh, back in the day. And now it's available, you know, affordably. So that's just great. Yeah. And it was a really great text that the Reformed Orthodox used. It's also something that someone like Bob Inc. was very interested in. Uh, in fact, before Bobbing became a professor, he was pastoring a church, and the one kind of academic thing he did was publish an edition of Leiden Synopsis. So it was important for Bobbing. It's important for us today. And uh, now that we have the translation, we have easy access to uh, really the sum total of, um, it just goes through all the loci of theology, starts out right with theology proper, and we're mm -hmm. in Disputation 7, uh, right at the beginning here on the Holy Trinity. Um, yeah, good. So we're just going to be looking at seven, eight, and nine, um, which is on the Holy Trinity, on the Father and the Son, and then on the Spirit. So we'll just talk through those in as long as it takes. Um, the Leiden synopsis is nicely laid out in each of these disputations. So like what you might call chapter seven is disputation seven, and it's made up of 50 numbered paragraphs. So you can actually, you know, make your way around and not by page number, but by we are in paragraph 47 of disputation seven, which is handy. So just a brief Indeed. word on, oh, go ahead, Ryan. Oh, go for it. Yeah, I was just going to say a brief word on the the history of the document. It's um, purer, the comparative, is kind of an interesting word to put in your title. You're obviously um, referring back to something that wasn't quite so pure. Um, in this case, it comes out about 1625. And um, so I don't know, big picture, you could think if you know King James Bible, 1611, you know, this is around that time, but it's not over in the English speaking world. It's in um, Leiden. Um, and that is the strong reformed Protestant theological faculty that had just had all the controversy with having hired, what would you say about Leiden theology in 1600? They had hired like Arminius and Gomaris as and, Gomaris. <laughs> <laughs> and te as teachers of reformed theology. And, yes. and then, of course, the controversy over the remonstrant or Arminian theology breaks out, and everything has to be clarified at the Synod of Dort. Um, so one thing you could say is it's it's Reformed theology after the clarification of the, the sort of Synod of Dort rejection of Arminianism. Is that? Yeah, I, I think so. And it's there's a lot of sparks flying during that time period, of course, at Leiden. I mean, there's very real characters involved. Uh, that are professors. One thing I really love about the disputation genre of which the Leiden is probably the most eminent example is that these are essentially what we might call today classroom notes that are, they vary in their quality. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, Leiden is a, a, is a heavily edited, but if you look across the disputation genre, they, they're going to vary in their, in their quality, but they're things that the professor would, would write up and the student would be essentially quizzed over. So they're really nice, short, pithy thesis statements that make a claim, require the student to understand what the claim is, and then argue in favor of that claim. Mm -hmm. And the Leiden uh, synopsis particularly was a collection of disputations that were written for classroom use, but also refined over various cycles of holding these disputations year after year. They were used in the classroom. So after a number of disputation cycles, they're bundled together and published. Mm. And that is the product that we have before us today. Nice. Yeah. So there's an intense period of development, 1620 to 1625, as they're sort of refined. There are four authors, mostly names you haven't heard of, unless you're really into this kind of stuff. So it's a, 
It's a group sort of a document, though hmm. one of these four authors will be named at the head of each disputation as the main author, and another one of the four will be named as a respondent. But it speaks with a unified voice, and that's kind of, I want to say, the whole point doctrinally and even politically of the Leiden synopsis is the preface, uh, which is dedicated to the the lords of the of the kingdom, say like we are, we speak single mindedly with one voice. This is the theology taught at this fine university. Right. Um, as opposed to you can imagine if you've got like Polyander and uh, Junius and or, or oh, not Junius, but um, Arminius and Gomarus teaching on the same faculty. There must have been something like a I'm going to go study theology at Leiden and everything's kind of three views, you know, three mm -hmm. views of this, three views of that, especially when you get into the soteriology, there are a number of positions represented by this diverse faculty. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this document is produced with a, a wonderful sort of coherence ironic. Yes. and yeah, yeah, unity. And it is ironic because they've already kicked out the people they disagree with and, and they're consolidating one way of being um, ironic, I suppose. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. So there was a period of confusion, and this yeah. is written in a period of self-confident consolidation yeah. of this is the proper Protestant view. Obviously, we could use the word, the adjectives we use here matter a lot. We could call it a narrowing or a hardening or a constriction, or you could say it It really is written in a lot of ways, sort of sweetly doctrinally, mm. um, uh, where it's attempting to to really take seriously the Christian theological task of stating and elaborating what scripture teaches. And maybe that's especially the case here in the doctrine of God. The core of the Leiden synopsis is that anti-remonstrant reformed theology, but it's not considered in a very narrow way, like all we care about is the five points of Calvinism. Yeah. Sort it's of not way. a lengthic either. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's much more Let's now touch on all the doctrines that are affected by this soteriology, and that turns out to be most of them. <laughs> so not, not an attempt to write a comprehensive systematic theology or a dogmatic system, but an attempt to really spell out all the ways in which the soteriology is implicated in the great Christian synthesis. Right. Yeah. And we're beginning here with paragraph one, which uh, Disputation 7, we've already covered uh, well, we haven't talked about, it, of course, but the, the, the disputants have covered a lot of the Deo Uno stuff, and now they're starting to enter into the Trinitarian section. What can we say about that, Fred? Yeah, well, first of all, um, just the text. They've just done one uh, disputation seven or six was on the doctrine of God. And so you get yeah. a long, it's got something like 50 paragraphs in it as well, divine attributes and ways of talking about God. And all that's really carefully covered. Um, and now it turns the corner to Disputation 7, paragraph 1, really just one sentence. Just as the Christian faith worships one God in Trinity, so too does it worship the Trinity of persons in the unity of the divine essence. Now, um, one thing I could say is there's a turn here from treating the doctrine of the one God to treating the doctrine of the triune God, mm -hmm. which in this opening paragraph is already sort of reanimated or reaffirmed like we're not leaving the doctrine of the one god we're considering it now with the triunity of the persons uh the the, the threeness of the persons made explicit right sometimes that that turning uh from essence and attributes to deo uno to de deo trino can be tricky uh, what are some of the pitfalls or the safeguards that we want to keep in mind as we as we make that turn yeah. Well, to go back to Disputation 6, you, you don't want to have carried out Disputation 6 as though you had never heard of the Trinity. You know, it's a, that too. Um, the doctrine of the one God is also a component part of the doctrine of the triune God. And so the, the whole time Leiden was handling that, it was well aware of um, the triunity of God. Um, it's just, it wants to say a lot of important things about um, the essence of God, um, so that now when we talk about the three persons who have that essence, hmm. uh, we're, we're specifying the subsistence of those three. So not so much an isolated unity or an abstract essence, something like that is going on behind the scenes. It's not the intention of starting with, uh, the things that are common, the hmm. things that are identical to all three divine persons, 
but nonetheless, uh, you know, we start with the oneness of God for principled reasons, and then we turn with the turn to uh, complete the doctrine of God uh, with the Trinity. Um, I don't know about you, Fred, but I th hear pretty clear Athanasian tones here. Um, what can we say about the creedal background of this? Yeah, Trinity and unity, and unity and Trinity is a, it's a right. mouthful. It's a lot of syllables in Latin and in yeah. English, um, and they're abstract, right? It's not oneness or three. It's not one and three. It's unity and trinity uh oneness and threeness basically um and so that that's already kicking things up to a a certain level of abstraction um mm. but i think for the goal of emphasizing that you're not choosing between unity and trinity it's mm. always those two things um operating together at the same time and then stated reversibly, there's some poetic power to that, I guess. Unity mm -hmm. and Trinity, Trinity and unity. Yeah, keep keep going with the line. Uh, I, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, some of the value of the Athanasian Creed is just giving us kind of the basic fundamental grammar of Christian confession mm -hmm. and telling us what to say, when to say it. Um, you know, say God is this and God is that, and 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 go down the line. There are also alternative models, though. I know you've talked about Fred for talking about the Holy Trinity. They're also creedal and valuable. Um, I know there's um, advantages to the Athanasian way to teach the basic grammar. Are there are there other emphases that we'd want to bring in that are important uh, to recall? Yeah, I, I do think um, so. You could start just with the relations themselves that yeah. are why we talk about abstract things like Trinity and unity. Um, so you could talk about the the father son relation, eternal generation. You could bring the spirit into that discussion. That's much more what I've called the Nicene sort of pattern of laying out the material. Um, and again, these are not alternative theologies; these are different dispositions of the same material. Um, the Leiden synopsis, as as we'll see in this section, um, it really is starting with the terms that we use, and so mm -hmm. the key terms, both of which are stated here: nature and person, or essence and person. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's going to spend the next several things talking, giving some preliminary meaning and content to those terms, working through the, working through the words. Yeah. Right. It'll eventually get to the relations just in terms of the approach. It's starting with like, we worship one God in Trinity of persons and we worship those three in the unity of the essence. Yeah. One thing that, you know, I, I always have my eye on when we start with the three persons or we start with for lack of better terms, the, the bald statements of mm -hmm. unity and Trinity or three persons. Um, I always have my eye on keeping, keeping those relations in the background of my mind as the mm -hmm. centerpiece. Um, Thomas Aquinas will call them the principles of distinction. So everything that is distinctive about the persons is somehow running back to their real relations, which are founded upon origin. Sometimes when you start off with the three persons right off the bat, you're you're kind of kind of trying to stuff the jack of the box back in uh in in in, in, in avoiding thinking of them in terms of absolute identities one two three this type of issue so there are, there are real potholes that need to be avoided um and uh, strengths to starting this way but just keeping the relations in view is something mm. i'm always concerned i think it's do. yeah it's Fair to say this is a species of scholasticism, right? In the right. in the sense that you have an inherited doctrine and you get down to the fundamental terms in the doctrine and you define how you're using those terms so that words get used a lot of different ways. Um, but when you specify how in this community of discourse, in this tradition of interpretation, how you intend this word to be taken, well, now you've got a term. You know, so mm -hmm. we say, well, let's come to terms about this. Yes, that's kind of a scholastic thing to do is say, Here's what we're going to mean by person. Here's why we mean it. It's not the mode of discovery, which would be like, I read the Bible. I see father and son loving each other. Um, what's the word for what father and son both are? God. No, no. I mean, what is each of them? Oh, they're both persons? Right. That's mm -hmm. not a Bible word. It's a word I felt the need to have when I began saying things about father and son. So you can see yourself kind of climbing up and discovering well, eventually you're going to get to a, a statement like, well, there must be three persons in the one essence. And you've now completely left behind the direct biblical terminology right. and realities in which you discovered your need to have a word for what there's three of and what there's one of. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that relationship to the biblical text is, I think, really important. The Leiden synopsis is, of course, important to Protestant theology. Um, in fact, for me, as I read this first paragraph, that's the thing that stands out here. Mm. Uh, Leiden seems to want to draw a comparison relationship between the set of truths that we would put under the header of Deo Uno or essence and attributes, the one God, the unity of God, the essence mm. of God those sets of truths, and then the other set of truths that we're talking about now, uh, having to do with the Trinity, the real distinction of divine persons. Mm. And I find it fascinating that the synopsis seems to want to draw a comparison relationship between those two. and says our standing towards either set of truths is really the same. Mm. And it's the same in one respect, but as you also know, it's very different in another respect that's always important to keep in mind. Uh, it's the same with respect to the scriptural text, which makes us to say God exists, God is wise, all these various truths that pertain to the unity. But the Holy Scripture also makes us to say these other things, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so it's the same with respect to that. It's also different, though, if you move outside the text, isolate the text, something like that, and you're wanting to do natural theology. Mm. Um, that's where we would want to make a real strong contrast in our method and even the kind of results that we're able to derive from nature with respect to God, things we can know are the things that are in common to mm. the divine persons. We can't know anything that's distinctive. We only know the things that are distinctive when God supernaturally reveals them in the text. And uh, so that, that principled posture towards Holy Scripture as the principle of knowing, to use a, a phrase that the Reformed Scholastics would use, uh, as our principle of knowing both the one God and the God who is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, mm. um, I find fascinating as the the first step of Leiden. It's firmly rooted in the text, and we're going to stay there. Even when we start talking about terms and definitions of person and Trinity, next time we'll see it's like, well, this is where this word is used in the text of Holy Scripture and where we're pulling it from and why we mean this word is because it's what Holy Scripture means, and mm. so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Later on in um, Disputation 7, the synopsis of pure theology will make that the distinction you just made much more directly. It'll say the the book of nature. I think we we ascend from what we see in the book of nature to affirm things about the creator, um, but only the book of scripture gives us uh, these distinctions between the persons, which is I find um, I find I need to rehearse that with with people when I'm teaching in churches or at the undergrad level, um, the, in terms of the function of general revelation or the natural knowledge of God, people tend to want to have sort of a two party system, you know, either you can know everything from nature or you can know nothing from nature, you know, and then nothing from nature would be something like you can construct an idol, but not the true God. So that doesn't really count as theology. And the other one would be, well, since let's say I'm persuaded by someone like Aquinas, there's five ways to prove, to reason our way to, there must be a creator. Mm -hmm. It must also be possible to demonstrate the Trinity from uh, from principles of pure reason. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the truth is not a two-party system. The, the truth right. is you can, you can absolutely, uh, reasoning correctly, demonstrate that there must be a God, but you cannot reasoning uh just from principles of nature demonstrate yeah. the triunity of that god and aquinas i think really clearly says even once it's been given even once knowledge of the trinity has been right. given by revelation you can't yeah. then go can't out circle back. <laughs> you can't circle back and hunt through natural principles and say oh yeah. all along these pointed to the trinity yeah what you can do is you can you you, you can't look for a, a proof right you can't look to to demonstrate but you can look for analogies or similitudes, illustrations to gain some understanding of what Father, Son, Holy Spirit is kind of like. Um, you can only know that there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit up there in God, so to speak, mm -hmm. from the text. But you can know from nature under the authority of the text, like here's a bit of where you might want to look to gain some understanding via usage of analogy, similitude, appropriation, these types of things that we we do in Trinitarian theology. Yeah, but you'd never be in a position of saying like, look, things are moving. Therefore, right. there must be movement right. mover and moved. Therefore, Trinity, or here's the structure of love, or here's the nature of mind. At no point will you demon we have a a proof where your dialogue partner, if reasoning rightly, will necessarily yeah. draw the conclusion, therefore God is triune. Right. And you know, sometimes 
people kind of get a little bit disappointed uh, when they come to that conclusion that, oh, you can't know God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit from nature. I personally have found it really freeing because I don't have to bother with looking so aggressively hard and just rely on Holy Scripture. And that's even one of the, fun like you mentioned Thomas Aquinas, one of the functions of Holy Scripture um, towards all of our truths about God, whether we're talking about essence and attributes or the Trinity, um, Holy Scripture makes it easier in a certain mm -hmm. mode to conclude things and to have certainty about what God is and what God has, the fact that God loves and such. Um, because we don't have to do all that hard work from nature, uh, it's it's a freeing experience. And then we can use nature under some relief of mm -hmm. uh you know, the burden of trying to prove our Trinitarian uh, doctrine from, from, from that. No, Christ says God is father and mm. therefore we know the Trinity. Um, that's all the farther we go in this life for knowing a proof about the Holy Trinity. Mm. Uh, and then we just search for illustrations uh, under guidance of God uh, yeah. as to gain some understanding. Yeah. Good. And there's, I should probably also point out, there's tons of room for analogical mental work within the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, you know, how is the son related to the father? What is that like? What, you know, what concepts can I use based on things I've observed? Um, but I, I find it helpful to say, keep your expectations set at the level of where mm -hmm. you're going to understand one particular part of the overall doctrine mm -hmm. from an analogical illustration is going to conceptually help that as opposed to getting seduced into thinking, I will find one master analogy or model that yeah. delivers the entire doctrine. That's yeah. just analogical thinking just isn't going to work at that comprehensive of a level. It's a little local tool that clarifies distinctions. Yeah. yeah, I find that to be very important. Sometimes people look at the medieval scholastics and they're a bit turned off uh, for the attempt to gain that global illustration. That's the magic key to unlock all of the Trinitarian doors. Sometimes I find the Greek fathers are more useful or more applicable for people because they are very ad hoc. In their illustrations and that's i think what you're pointing out here is for a certain job to understand a certain part so to speak this is a good illustration and this is where we use this illustration this illustration is not useful elsewhere perhaps mm -hmm. in the doctrine of holy trinity um, proceeding in that fashion i find the fathers do uh, a bit more than the scholastics who kind of go for broke <laughs> and we can argue about whether they made it or not but uh, it's yeah. at least yeah. it's at least quite the climb yeah, it is good to know. I mean, some people are afraid of scholasticism or put off by it. There's some always some polemics against it out there. Um, sure. It's it is good to remember what scholasticism as a, you know, as a framework is good at what it's not that good at. Well, you know, it's a yep. it's a particular complex tool and it's yep. good for certain things. Absolutely. In, in the case of the um, synopsis of pure theology that we're looking at. I think you see its strengths and weaknesses right away in this opening move. It is answering a question that probably hasn't occurred to most normal people thinking about the Trinity. It's going to mm -hmm. get right into the question, what is the definition of a Trinitarian person? What, right. what do we mean by this word? And you can see it set up already here in paragraph one. Well, yep. Right. Logically speaking, that's where we're going to have to go. You said person and you said essence. Now let's say what we mean by that. Right. Um. I guess if <laughs> I studied with some people um, at the uh, Dominican school in Berkeley who um, had been raised on a really strongly scholastic, like this is how they had been taught everything. Sure. And it was easy for them to be kind of dismissive of it, not of the content of the theology, but in the sense of like, well, the way you learn is you are told a series of distinctions that it had not even occurred to you yet to wonder about. Right. But they are all carefully packed in your mind, precept yeah. on precept. So that eventually when you discover in scripture why you should care about them, you'll have mm. them ready to go. Yes. You'll, you'll go all scholastic brain and you'll just spit all out, uh, <laughs> spit out right. all the right answers immediately. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So something like that's probably going on here. Like I, um, I have a very biblical and gospel based mm -hmm. and missions of the person's approach right. to the doctrine of the Trinity. Right. And so the why does this matter question is constantly being answered as you go. Well, right. we're talking about the sending of the son. That's right. why this matters. Um, Leiden's participating partly. It's certainly scriptural, it's certainly gospel focused, but right. it's partly participating in the scholastic strategy of answering. Mm. What are they? They're not the first questions that arise to your mind. They're the fundamentally, uh, they're the logically most fundamental distinctions 
that you'll end up needing to make later. Right. And what's important to remember is those logically most fundamental are the last things you discover <laughs> in the order of discovery. Um, so yeah, the, 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 why does this matter question, I suppose is, is quite important. Mm -hmm. Scholasticism is good for what it's good for, and it's mm -hmm. not good for, for what it's not good for. Um, and this pertains to Leiden as well. Yeah. We should also, um, not overlook the word worship here. So the, the, the orientation of this opening move, the opening gambit is all about worship. Hmm. So there is a certain way in which it is um, applied or is is relevant, right? Because it's not just what is the right thought to have about God. Right. No, that, that thought is in the context of spiritual worship and having um, appropriate thoughts about God, you know, that recognize uh, what has been made known to us. So, yeah. There's not an effusive, warm-hearted kind of way of saying it, but it is, you know, uh, twice the word worship occurs here to orient us to what the task is going to be. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, um, there are 50 paragraphs in here, and I think paragraph one is kind of the shortest, but we needed yeah. to uh, set up the task of what we're going to be doing with the synopsis of pure theology. Any last thoughts on it? Nope, I'm ready to uh, get into thesis number two eventually here. All right, great. Well, we'll see you then for that.